welcome to the 52nd episode of the Friday, no, 53, no, 52nd, we did 51, right. yeah. was our awards. Never mind. We're leaving this in here, Scott. <laughs> Damn welcome it. to the 52nd episode of the Friday Nightmare Podcast. If you're a first-time listener, buckle up. I am one half of your hosting team, Heather Powell, coming to you today from Waterdown, Ontario, Canada. And with me, as always, is Mr. Smoke Show Crawford, coming to you from the town of Swartz Creek, in the county of Genesee, in the state of Michigan, in the United States of America, in the North American continent, in the Western Hemisphere, on the planet Earth, in the Milky Way galaxy. I'm fully vaxxed, boosted, and waxed, ready to climax, and if you can, please get me wet, feed me after midnight, and tell me to sit down. I'll tell you why I say that in a bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am very excited to be back to our regular scheduled programming. Um, as we talked about in our last episode, we did uh, our own personal top 50 horror movies. Prior to that, we did awards. Prior to that, we did a whole bunch of top fives. Uh, we are now going back to the good old days when Scott and I would pick a topic, a main topic, and we would discuss four movies from that main topic, as well as talk about 2022 releases, which, well, it's, it's been a go with those. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can say that so far. Um, Scott and I will tell you what you should watch and not watch, I guess. Um, oh, I forgot one on here. We both saw it. We'll have to add it. Um, the one about the cliffs. I don't see it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you want to type it while I'm talking? Do you mind? Yeah, I don't uh, Throw it wherever you want. We both watched it, so we can both talk about it. So we do have a bunch of 2022s that we will talk about that we have seen and give you some recommendations, whether that is something that you want to watch or not. We also talk about older watches. So these are films that are not from 2022 that Scott and I have seen. And, you know, maybe they are classics. Maybe they're hidden gems. We've switched up our what we've been listening to because we've covered a lot of podcasts over the past two years. And we switched it to what's new. So what's new section will now involve, you know, anything from a horror magazine that we've read, like there's magazines anymore, but anyway, um, video games, a TV show, uh, whatever, anything yep. that is Books, horror, movies, music, music, whatever, anything that's horror adjacent, or even if it's maybe like something that could be a horror movie, but a lot of people wouldn't consider it a horror movie. Um, I have a movie that I want to talk about next time we record that I think falls into this category and, you know, stuff like that. We're just using it. And of course we will still shout out new podcasts and stuff as, uh, as they come around and we want to support our podcasting brothers and sisters in arms. But otherwise, Scotty, you had a really big night last night and I know you're dying to tell people about it. So why don't you oh, yeah. share with us what adventures and shenanigans you got up to last night? All right. So yeah, last night, uh, me, uh, Mandy, uh, Tim and his girlfriend, uh, went to go see, uh, Colin Mockery and Brad Sherwood from Whose Line Is It Anyways doing improv at the Capitol Theater in Flint. And uh, I'm a, I've am i been a huge fan of Whose Line Is It Anyways since I was like a kid. Still watch to this day, find it funny as hell just because I do love improv comedy. And Colin Mockery is one of my favorites out of that, on that show. And Brad Sherwood is also pretty damn funny. And oh my God, this was two to two and a half hour show. And it was just absolutely incredible. Like, they kind of took, like, some segments from, like, their Whose Lines Anyways show, like, what they would do, like, uh, the sound effects one where they'd call people up on stage to create sound effects for whatever they're doing, like, they're acting out a scene, and they'll have sound effects, and the people they pull up there have to try to make the sound effects for them, and it's funny as hell. I was hoping to get called up for that, unfortunately did not, because that's the one I've always, that's, like, my favorite segment in Whose Line, and I was wanting to be on that for so bad, but, no, didn't get that one, but it was still funny as hell to watch. But I did end up getting called up on the stage and uh, with five other people. And well, uh, first, when they called me up, Brad Sherwood pointed to me because I had my hand raised like, oh, yeah, I'll do this. And uh, <laughs> he pointed to the man in the red shirt with the glorious beard. I'm like, yay. <laughs> and, uh, Aww. They weren't like, <laughs> smoke show is in the house, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, they probably thought it. Oh, I'm sure they were like, oh, my God, I can't believe smoke show Crawford's here. He's, he's such a celebrity. Oh, my God. But, there uh, are dozens of listeners were there as well last night. Exactly. Is what you're saying. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so 
I get called on stage and the, uh, they wanted you to wear a mask when you were near them. So I made sure to put my mask on. I was putting my mask on as I was walking. And one of the ladies that got called up on stage, I was following her. I was confused because I seen her go and walk up to the very front row and sit in one of the seats. I'm going, okay, I guess that's where we go. So I sat down next to her and we're sitting there. All of a sudden, Brad Sherwood's looking around going, wait, where are uh, where are a couple of the uh, people that we picked in the, from the crowd? It's like, what, what the hell, where'd they go? And I'm like, yeah, that's weird. I'm looking around. I'm like, that's weird. He looks down. He's going, oh, it's you two. Why are you in the front row? You're supposed to be over there. We're going, oh, okay. Uh, Only you, whoops. Scotty. Only you would be that well, wrong at all. Well, my dumbass didn't see where he pointed. And I followed who I found out later, a very drunk woman. <laughs> nice. I like the way she rolled. It'd be like you and me. Yeah, pretty um, much. <laughs> at an event. That's very but, uh, accurate. But yeah, then we uh, get over to the side where he has us uh, standing by there. And the skit they ended up doing was like, you know, acting out a story, like both mm-hmm. of them going back and proving. And either Brad or Colin would eventually, in the middle of the story, raise their hand and we would take turns on finishing their sentences. And then they would continue the story and add in what we said to try to add to the story and, you know, make it difficult for themselves. <laughs> um, it got to be really ridiculous and funny. But uh, one thing that uh, they said before they started was, all right, so if... Uh, if we don't like what you, uh, like, if we're not a fan of what you said and don't like how to add it to our story, Colin will yell, sit down <laughs> at you, and you have to go sit down. And, uh, yeah, I can't remember all of it, but apparently, uh, like, it was basically, like, Colin was an elf that was looking for love and blah, blah, blah. And so he's like, yeah, so one of the things I want to do for love, like, to show that I really love a person is, and he raised his hand, and I went, dancing with elephants. So he just he stops, looks over at me, and then continues on, like, actually uses it in the story. Nice, nice. <laughs> then, uh, but yeah, the lady behind me was super drunk, and when she came up, I forgot what she said, but she whispered into the mic, everything, everything she said, she whispered into the mic, like this. <laughs> like, just, oh like, all God. creepy. <laughs> it's like, what the fuck? But, uh. <laughs> um, I'd be like, to get D, like this. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, then it came around, like, I think I ended up going three rounds before I got yelled at. Oh, yeah, me too. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry, like, we're talking about comedy. Sh- okay. <laughs> but, uh, Sorry, that was comparing what we did last night. <laughs> anyway. They were talking about something sexual, so I brought up, uh, I just spouted out, because I think it on the spot, I was having a hard time, and I just said, chafed nipples. <laughs> and Colin just turns to me and goes, sit down! I'm going, okay. <laughs> oh, man. And everyone in the audience was fucking dying laughing, like Mandy was laughing her ass off, Tim and, uh, Tim and Veronica were laughing their asses off, going, At that chafed. point, did they move? To a different they, seating area? They, they wanted to, because they looked at me and go, chafed nipples? Really? I'm going, hey, you know. <laughs> well, you're in the moment, right? You're yeah. just in the moment. You know, you just hashtag living your best life and freeloading. Oh, right? but yeah, it was it was just so much damn fun. Like, uh, the theater itself is just fucking gorgeous. Like, you've seen the pictures that I posted. and Yes, yeah. it was gorgeous. It looked like you guys had a fabulous evening. I was so happy I did. you. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Like, you had more fun if I was there, but, you know. Of course. (laughs) COVID. But but COVID is slowly, we're lifting restrictions here in Ontario. Yeah. Where you guys have, like, none in Michigan anymore. No, we're uh, we're, we're on fucking Mad Max rules over here now. We're, we're, we're like, we're like the hand, not the handmaid still has a bad I don't know what to compare it to. We still have restrictions in place. We're still treating it like it's outbreak. Um, But, you know, I... The reality is the, the variant has now um, diluted to a common cold for, you know, for most people. Of course, I'm going to acknowledge there are people out there that are still getting very sick, but it's just not in the same volume. So I'm hoping we get rid of the PCR testing to go back and forth between our two countries. And the moment that happens, I will be making a plan to come out and see Scotty. Before yeah. that trip used to seem so like, oh, man, I don't know if I really want to do this because it's a long drive. But now I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> So I do I'm prefer ready. when Scott comes here because I think it's more fun when Scott comes here, personally. Well, and plus, like I had never been to your country before, so there was a lot to show me and excited. You've been here multiple times, like and you've yeah. been to Michigan a couple times too. Yeah, and like in Michigan, it's not as most, exciting. No, you don't live in the most happening area, Scott. <laughs> no, I do not. <laughs> It's a very chill, boring area. <laughs> no, yes, you know. And you have your own room here. Exactly. I have all my own food. Actually, you know what? Fuck that, Scott. You're just going to keep coming here. I don't want to go back here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come back for your 50th birthday. How's that? 10 years oh, wow. from now. <laughs> all right, know. that's fair. Or I don't know. Like, you have some big life event. I'll come down for that. Astronomicon is not a big life event. Just so we're clear, by the way, I wouldn't consider Astronomicon a big life event. 
And I, and you know, I don't even know, like I like conventions and shit, but I don't know if I like them as much as I thought I did. Cause like, I only like going for a couple of hours and then I'm done. Right. I think it's more fun. Like when you go by yourself, especially it's like, yeah, you just walk around see what you need to see and then you get out. Um, yeah. But if you have friends and stuff, it's fun. Cause you can meet up, have some drinks and just kind of wander around and hang out. Like, I think if we met up with everyone from the cast uh, podcasting community, I'd be fucking shit faced the entire time. So, oh, hell yeah. Like, hell yeah. We just party. <laughs> I mean, I was like, I mean, be like they were like, who were the uh, panels? I'd be like, I don't give a fuck. There's panel, there panels. <laughs> yeah, that would be me. I'd be like, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> I'm just trying to get dick down <laughs> to get some drinks. <laughs> of course you are. <laughs> oh my gosh! Oh. Well, I'm so glad you had fun last night. Um, here we are, mid February, finally getting to our 2022 watches. Uh, I got it right, 2022. Yay! Usually first try. This, I know. Usually this time I'm like 2021. Well, <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, though, we have had about almost two months worth of uh, time yeah. for you to get used to saying 2022 since we've done right. this type of show. <laughs> right, right. And we watched some fucking gems, Scotty and I. So we oh, are definitely. Absolutely. I finally saw the Oscar nominated film that is Scream 5. Um, so I'm very excited to talk about my experience with that today. Spoilers, I didn't hate it. Um, I'm a bigger Scream fan than Scott is, but Scott's assessment was pretty marked. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, so I guess we'll we'll break into what we've been watching. Um, the first one is called Kindred. Did you see this one, Scotty? I did. I don't remember a damn thing about it. And see, that tells everybody you definitely <laughs> need to go check out this bad boy. I mean, also, so, to be fair, these were movies we've watched in the last month and a half, two months, because I mean, it's been a while. But yeah, while. this one did not stick with me at all. No, this was released like literally January 1st. Uh, so here's the synopsis. It's a 94 minute runtime. After her father's suicide, a young mother investigates what led to his death, but she's haunted by spirits and unearths an unsolved mystery from 30 years ago. She discovers a dark family history that can prove deadly for her child. I remember this was very much a low-budget family deception film. And what she finds out is very fucked up about her family and why her dad killed himself and who was really her dad and not her dad and Anyway, okay, yeah. it's uh it's it's available on Apple iTunes. Apple iTunes. <laughs> <laughs> Apple iTunes. On Apple iTunes, iTunes, Google Play, uh, Voodoo, YouTube, and Microsoft Score store. I uh, I don't even recommend renting it. I don't think it's that great. I think it's fine, you know, like for people that are looking at making a film yet again. If you're looking at making a film one day and you want to watch as many low budgets as possible to kind of understand what you're working with, sure, check it out. But it was nothing to write home about. Neither Scotty or I is overly yeah, like, engaged about it. Like, I remember watching it going, yeah, like, I didn't hate my time with it, but I don't remember a damn thing about it. Right. You just sometimes you just forget. Um, next one that we have on here is C for me. Yeah. Now I think we both watched this yep. one. Did we not? Yes, we did. Um, I'll let you talk about it and then I'll go ahead. All right. So I'll do the synopsis, but, uh, C for me is about a blind, uh, blind former skier who cat sits in a secluded mansion when three thieves invade for a hidden safe. Her only defense is army veteran Kelly, who she meets on a C for me app. And uh, Kelly basically helps her try to guide around the house and to escape. Um, yeah, this movie was actually uh, pretty decent and pretty tense. Like, uh, uh, I don't like the main character at all. She is just an awful person. Um, but at this, like, so I really couldn't get behind her. And like, yeah, I still kind of question going blind person watching a cat. Um, really? That's kind of weird because cats are fairly quiet. So how are you ever going to find it and take care of it? And whatnot okay but sure i do like the whole uh don't breathe type uh home invasion with a blind person being the uh protagonist um and yeah i thought it was pretty entertaining like all around like it was it had some very uh tense moments to it yeah i think scott did it. this is actually a canadian film by the way um oh, okay yeah so it's a homegrown local lower budget film with some decent acting uh the young lady skylar devonport uh, was quite good. Uh, she's only had a couple of roles so far. And I got to say, I, I did very much enjoy her in this. Uh, Jessica Parker, who was the chick that played the um, the woman from the app, has been in films like The Perfect Guy, Cam, 
Um, let's see what else would people know. Probably those are the two biggest ones that she's been in. And I thought she did pretty good. Like I thought the acting in this was pretty average. Yeah. The, it wasn't anything over the top, but it wasn't horrible. Yeah. And I thought the main, the main character did well. Uh, just, she definitely made me not like her. Yeah. She was definitely like an anti hero in a sense, because she yeah. was very bitter about what had happened to her and, was engaging in some illegal like activities, but the movie kept me engaged. Like yeah. I definitely cared what was going to happen. It's a 92 minute runtime. It doesn't overstay its welcome. It's very much a thriller. Like um, don't breathe that other one that came out a couple of years ago uh, with the woman who was oh, um, uh, uh, deaf. Hush. Hush. Very similar to Hush. Only you feel more empathy for the main character in Hush than you do yeah. for this chick. Um, but I enjoyed the ending. I thought that it was decent. I thought that it was a good little ride. And really, it's available on Apple iTunes, Google Play, Amazon Video, Microsoft Store, Cineplex. I think a three ninety nine, two ninety nine rental. If you like those kind of home invasion movies, you'll enjoy this. Yeah, I agree. Right. Like it was definitely. It's not like it's not really high on my list at the moment. I mean, like nothing really is at the moment. But uh, yeah, it was still yeah enjoyable. Yeah, like it wasn't. It wasn't a bad watch. And I think that if you as I said, if you like home invasion films, like if that's a subgenre that you really enjoy, I think you'd be at a miss not watching this one. I think this would definitely hit that fancy. Um, but if you <laughs> don't care for invasion film, home invasion films, then I would say skip it. Uh, it's not going right. to do anything for you. The next film on here is actually another Canadian film, low budget Canadian film, and it is called Ditched. And it is an 86 minute runtime. And it's built around a pretty fucking fascinating concept to me. Yeah um scott and i both watched this i think scotch watched it first and mm -hmm. then told me about it and basically we start the movie right off after an accident scene in an ambulance now we put together that the people in this ambulance so we have a couple of players we have obviously the paramedics um there's a police officer on scene and there is criminals and the accident has been horrific obviously it's been pretty bad people are pretty hurt and people are getting knocked off one by one by a group of vigilantes. And this movie relies a lot on dialogue, uh, very, very heavy dialogue. Probably the biggest name that you'll see in this movie is, what is it, Chris Lorander? Is that probably one of the biggest names that you'll see? There was, who would play the bad guy? I'm trying to look him up here. Oh, Mackenzie Gray. You'll probably recognize Mackenzie Gray from Grave Encounters, Man of Steel, oh. Rabid. Um, so he's had, you know, a couple of, you know, well-known roles. So if you, he's the main antagonist, I guess you could say. Or is he an antagonist? Begs the question. Mm -hmm. um, this movie does really explore the concept of an eye for an eye. What were your general thoughts, Scotty? I really dug this film. Um, I didn't know what way it was going when it first started off. Like, I thought it was a completely different type of horror uh, genre in the horror, uh, mm -hmm. horror category. And I was wrong, but at the same time, pleasantly surprised by the way it went. And man, like, yeah, like, I like this concept a lot. I thought it was very interesting and unique and uh, like had some pretty violent moments to it and had a pretty downbeat ending, too. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. But I yeah, found was, this to be very solid. This is probably one of my more favorite films I've seen so far. And a possibility for best kill for me. Um, or at least an acknowledgement in our awards of the kill. Because it was done on low low budget, special effects. I think I, I think Scott knows which kill I'm referring to. Yeah. Um, I thought it was fucking exceptional, uh, the practical effects. Yet again, use their budget well. An example yeah. of using your budget well. Uh, what do I think it's one of the best low budget movies to come out? No, of course not. But I don't think it's shitty. So I think if you enjoy the whole concept of revenge and is an eye for an eye, a true justification of stuff that happens. And I like how this movie keeps you guessing at the end about a specific character. And if that character is telling the truth or not, I really, really right. appreciated that. Um, I thought that was really cool. So it is available on iTunes, Google Play, YouTube. Microsoft Store. All right, Scotty, I'll, you saw. Have you seen this one? I have not. Mm. You are ahead of me by two movies right now. Am I really? Uh, yeah, doesn't mean much. Um, this is the first Shutter original from this year. The last thing Mary saw. It is an eighty-nine minute runtime for me. It felt like three hours. 
Um, that's also because this, this particular genre is challenging for me to sit through. Scotty might watch this film and find it a little bit more enjoyable. He tends to like period pieces a lot more than I do. Yeah. So he may have a much more, um, different view of this film. I will say it's a quality film. Like this is a movie that obviously had some money put into it. Uh, the acting in it is very different decent rory culkin's in it and man he's a good fucking actor oh i didn't realize he was in this yeah like i feel like rory culkin does not get the ex- the recognition that he deserves i think he's starting he's to quite, though yeah i think he is starting to because i saw him in another movie um an older watch and he was like the best part of the movie uh he's a really good actor i really do enjoy him so anyway he's in this it's basically you know it's about witchcraft in the 1800s and a forbidden relationship and what happens to this young girl and she's basically testifying about events that occurred it's a very dark film and i don't mean dark like oh it's a dark concept i mean like physically dark film like it's it's like filmed a lot in nighttime with candlelight so make sure you're watching it on a screen that you can easily view not my not my cup of tea but not a bad film perhaps if scotty watches it he can give an update version of what he thought of it um because it is more of his thing than it is of mine and it is available on you know all the shutter so whether you have actual shutter amazon shutter or amc plus you can watch this movie nice yeah i will definitely have to watch this one here in the next week or so if i get the time i just been uh so busy at work that i have not watched much and haven't had a lot of free time at home lately and it's dark scotty you need to watch this at home because you won't be able to see um and it will be interesting to hear your thoughts because you enjoy period pieces much more than i do right you might get a different perspective to this it not bad not bad just wasn't my thing nope that is fair i yeah. will definitely have to get back to you on this one um but yeah the next one uh is arctic void uh the synopsis is when the power mysteriously fails and almost everyone vanishes from a small tourist vessel in the arctic fear becomes the master for the three who remain forced ashore the the men deteriorate in body and mind until a dark truth emerges that compels them to ally or pa- perish. Um, and wow, I watched this. Uh, I watched this on a random whim because I'm like, okay, I read the synopsis. I'm going, ooh, sounds interesting, like a mystery style horror film. Count me in. I really dug this one. This is also high up there with ditched for me. Like, I really, really dug the concept of this. I, I liked that there was like the american documentary crew like doing uh going like out into the what was it uh they were in norway i think yeah they were in norway i think is where they're supposed yeah, to they be yeah they were on the fjords and uh yeah i love that just all of a sudden everyone disappears off the ship and you don't know what happened and then there's this weird like mystery that's for the most part not really explained but at the mm-hmm. same time like it keeps you fascinated wondering what's going to happen next and mm-hmm. i just found the acting in this to be really really well done and like yeah, I think the mystery itself just kept me wanting to watch more and to see what happened. Like, I just found it fascinating. Yeah, I think that definitely it was more of a you movie than it was a me movie. It's an 85 minute runtime. I will say that the runtime for this movie is sufficient. You get enough character development. You get enough understanding of the situational horror they're in. Very clearly inspired by the thing. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> right? Now, it, you know, not as good, just so we're clear. Um, but very right. much inspired. And it's not bad the actors in it all have some acting chops all have a pretty good you know list of films they've been in before we got michael weaver tim griffin uh well-known actors done a lot of stuff in their previous um you know acting chops it was fine it was it was entertaining enough um i think that if you like environmental horror or survival horror a little bit more this would be something for you so i would say apple or so itunes google play voodoo microsoft store i know like apple tunes is now my new no, no, name no i just liked how you said i'd say apple <laughs> like, in, like i think you were about to say i'd say rented or whatever but you yeah <laughs> yeah see scott yeah you're right because i don't think people should rent it you can rent it if you want to it is two nine i would say a 2.99 rental is uh i and this was where i'd say i disagree in the most part i'd say i'd rent it for 5.99 really okay. Yeah, okay i so really you- enjoyed this So you got two different opinions here. Decide what you like and, you know, if it's worth the rental cost for you. Um, iTunes, Google, Voodoo, Microsoft Store, YouTube, all available for you to rent. Um, Yeah, I will say it's creative. It's a creative concept, um, right? And I'm very curious about this masterpiece. (laughs) 
All right, have you seen this? Oh, hell no, I have not. I refuse to watch it. <laughs> so I think it said The Requin. Is that what yep. you said? Requin? Um, okay. It's an 89-minute runtime. I watched this movie because I saw Alicia Silverstone was in it. And, you know, I thought it would be nice for me to try to support her because she hasn't been in a lot of stuff in a while. There's a reason <laughs> why. <laughs> she hasn't um you know bless her heart she um anyway uh yeah this was not a good movie I don't even know how to talk about it it's <laughs> supposed to be a shark film but the concept is so ridiculous it's they're staying at this all-inclusive resort I think in Thailand which Thailand doesn't have all-inclusive resorts but anyway and they're staying out on an ocean villa so these do exist where there's ocean villas where you have like a little room or whatever on, you know, in a hut that's, you know, attached to a dock that is kind of like floating and then you can go swimming off of it and stuff. And of course she had a miscarriage and, you know, there's like, I'm so tired of that concept being used about miscarriages and women and have to take over it. Like when it's done well, like false positive and stuff like that, it's great. Right. Or swallow, it's done great, but shit, it's not done well. Anyway, a storm comes and their little hut gets tossed out to the middle of the ocean to give you an idea of how ridiculous this film is. Um, and there's a shark attack and the shark is, you're cheering for the shark because you're hoping the shark will eat them and end the movie. And it is the longest <laughs> 89 minutes you will experience. Uh, don't watch it. It makes the great white movie that came out last year with cool. like Jaws. Oh, ow, like that's wow. Okay. That Tim Davis is like, how dare you use that movie in comparison to Jaws? All I'm saying, Tim Davis, is that this movie is so bad that it makes Great White look like, you know, one of the best shark movies of our time. Like it's Well, just, and I it's think so Tim horrible. Davis may agree with you on that part. Like, it's just so horrible. Um, and I don't know. I hope Alicia Silverstone, I don't know. I hope this is just a bad apple if she chose. Right. I don't know. I, it's on iTunes, Google, and YouTube, and Microsoft Store. But honestly, I wouldn't rent it. Save your money. I don't watch it, actually. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to, no, I'm not even going to waste my time. No, um, it was a big disappointment. So do not bother. And once Tim Davis like started like going, oh my, like because he's you know a fan of shark films and usually is a little more lenient on shark films. And when he said this one was bad, I'm going, okay. Oh, he horrible. says it's bad, I am going to avoid it. Like it's just it's horrible. Like it's not even bad. It's it's straight up horrible, which is a sad thing to say because it's horrible. Like it's just <laughs> it's horrible. And I keep repeating it like it's horrible. It's horrible. Like I'm racking back and forth, but it's it really is not a good movie. I'm at all. scarred. I'm scarred for Honestly, life. Honestly, it was such a piece. Like and even the concept was so fucking stupid. Like it was just it was so dumb and it was just so what poorly written and poorly acted and oh like i don't know <laughs> i don't know man it was just not it was just not a good movie anyway we should move on because i feel like i'm just like gonna have an anniversary you're, yeah i'll say you're scarred right so did you watch this one the unborn nope okay and this is a Tubi original, so woo Tubi, you're getting no, your Tubi. own originals now. I, yeah, because um, I think this is like the second one this year they've released. Yeah, honestly, it wasn't bad for a cultish movie, and literally it's about cult. So it's a 94-minute runtime, uh, nothing we ain't seen before, only this time. It's a lesbian couple that gets pregnant. Ah, snap! Um, which, I don't know, I think someone made a, a reference recently that they don't understand this inclusion of um, the LGBT community more and more. And I, I think it's, I think what we need to understand is that this is normal. Right. You know, people love who they love. And if it happens to be two people that are, you know, identify as female or identify as male, then that, you know, that's included in the movie. It's nothing different. Just because you're straight doesn't mean that other people who aren't straight is different and that people are just including it to be woke. That's just part of our world now. Um, gender is definitely a concept that we made up. And that's fine. If you like, I associate with being a straight heterosexual female. I'm as straight and heterosexual and white as you can possibly get. You look up fucking white chick in the dictionary, it's my face with a white claw. Like, totally me. <laughs> like, but I don't look at a movie and go, oh my God, why is there an LGBTQ couple in this movie? Like, I don't, it doesn't matter. It, that's not part of the plot. Um, you should be focusing on what's actually happening to the people, not their sexual orientation, unless the movie is about sexual orientation. Anyway, right. Rant, rant done. Um, so basically they're going through fertility treatments. They, they get pregnant and then weird shit starts to happen. And some pretty actually cool kills happen in this film. I got to say like Tubi obviously has some money because there are some pretty cool kills that, that happen in this film. And 
you know, for a free watch on Tubi, I enjoyed it. It's easy to easy to watch. The characters are easy to believe. The acting is good enough. Um, you know, none of the actors in it are like, oh my god, they're the best actors I've ever seen in my entire life. But they're not horrible. They're 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 there. Um, maybe the detective is a little weak. He's probably the one that's like a little cheese cheese. But for a free watch on Tubi, I say go for it. And it's a free watch nice. on Tubi. You know. Yeah, but I will have to watch this one and then the one that Tony Todd was in that I have not watched yet. Yeah, I I haven't watched that one either, so we'll have to check that out for sure. Yeah, because we might have I, to do a Tubi Award this year, Scott. Yeah, right. I was like, yeah, they're coming right. coming on strong already. Right, we'll do a Tubi Award. All right, so yeah, we'll jump on to the uh, next movie, and this one, I believe, am I the only one that's seen this? Which one is it? Freefall. Yep. Yeah, I've seen Freefall. You've seen it? No, 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 no. Okay. All right, so yeah, the, this one is called The Free Fall, and the synopsis is, Sarah wakes up from a coma to a life she doesn't remember, a fragile, slippery reality that spirals into a nightmare where nothing is as it seems. Uh, it stars Sean, As- uh, Sean Ashmore, uh, who plays... Does he have a uh, shirt on? Yes. He oh, actually nice. looks like he actually looks like he's not just trying to show off a sexy bot this time. Because there was that movie last year that he took off his shirt every time he was his wife. I don't know. Out. I didn't watch it, but I remember oh, you man. talking about it. <laughs> every time he was like... I gotta take my shirt off now. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he plays. Uh, he like I've always liked Sean Ashmore. I think he's a good actor, and uh, like he ba- he plays her husband in this. And I found this to be once again one of those where it's just like, okay, what the fuck's going on? I I'm like it's piecing everything together little by little. Definitely more of a lower budget indie film, but I really dug that. I dug this story quite a bit. Like uh, like the acting was pretty damn good. Um, and like the pacing I thought was really good and just the mystery that is unraveling when it's finally fully revealed, you're just going, well, did not fucking see that coming. Okay. Wow. Uh, it's, I don't want to say much cause yeah, like I, this is something you just kind of got to watch to see how it unravels. But like, I just found this to be a very interesting watch for something that when I looked at the cover, I'm going, eh, I don't expect a whole lot from this, but yeah, I was impressed. I thought it was really good. Nice. And awesome. then it can, and it is available on. Hold on, my phone froze. There it goes. Uh, Apple iTunes, Google Play. No, see, now I did it too. Apple iTunes. Apple iTunes. That's what it's now called. You heard it first uh, here on Friday Nightmares. Voodoo and Amazon. Um, but yeah, I definitely, I'd say this is worth at least a two ninety nine, three ninety nine rental. Awesome, awesome. I'll check it out, Scotty, because we uh, we have someone's Plex that allows us to get screeners. Exactly. We like we're it. Kind of, we're kind, we're of, kind of a big deal. Beard flip. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Beard flip. <laughs> All right. The next one is on here is an, is the second Shutter release of the year. Um, that's an original Shutter release or whatever, exclusive to Shutter. Um, are you slapping yourself? Oh, slap! Yeah. <laughs> Look at slap face. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> have you watched this one yet, Scotty? I'm about halfway through it, and I've had I haven't had a chance to finish it. Um, it's an 85 minute runtime. It is uh, is interesting enough. It's a good little creature feature. Uh, it takes on some pretty heavy social issues uh, throughout the film. The acting is pretty good, especially by the the kids. Uh, there's August um Matoo, um Mikey Manning excellent I think August does a really great job he was in the nun by the way that was the other movie that probably oh, okay. people would have recognized him from um Mike Manning was in MFA was also in the call um so he's had you know some acting chops as well too and I enjoyed it for what it is I think out of the two movies on shutter that have been released this year so the last thing mary saw and slap face i enjoyed slap face more um, okay this is a creature feature which is also kind of exploring um you know along the same lines of come play the din the gin in sense of social issues and a creature that comes because of it so hey, creature that comes <laughs> not that kind of comes Scott. oh lame that's a different oh, film now i'm now, now i don't want to finish it He's not even going to climax. That's disappointing. Well, I guess he does in a sense, <laughs> if you consider murder climax. I mean, for a monster, yeah. All right, yeah. So Scott obviously had a really good night last night. Um... <laughs> <laughs> With myself. With myself. <laughs> I woke up in the morning. And I made me pancakes. <laughs> yeah. I, I woke up in the morning, slapped my own ass, and was like, "God, good morning to you." Sexy. <laughs> like so naughty (laughs) we're in for every all our if we have new listeners i hope you're enjoying this is our 
professional <laughs> approach that we take to every podcast. So buckle up. It's a good time. Um, just like me. All right. Like, I love how slap face is like, it takes on bullying and Scott's making fun of it. Like, it's <laughs> domestic abuse. Like, it's like all the movies he can bring that up and he's like, slap face. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, that's I what, didn't, that's I didn't what say Scott that. I do. So for everyone that when you watch the opening scene in this movie, the reason why it's called slap face is because and this isn't a spoiler. There's a game that these two brothers play where they slap each other in the face. That's what Scott and I do when we get together. Yeah. <laughs> We're coming up with ideas for Friday nightmares. And, and whatever, me, mostly hitting Scott. Yeah, which, I was gonna say whenever I come up with a bad idea, I get slapped in the face. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, can you imagine? Oh. Uh, which, by the way, is not okay. Just so we're clear, right? Exactly, <laughs> not okay behavior unless that's what your partner consents to, and everyone is consenting adults. You want exactly, to exactly, that, right? Um, anyway, slap face is available. <laughs> Shutter. <laughs> wants to watch it, and it's available on all the shutters. So whether you have it through Amazon Prime or AMC, yeah, I, def- I definitely think it's worth a watch if you enjoy creature features. And it doesn't overstay its welcome. It's only an eighty-five minute runtime, so I don't think you're gonna um, dislike your time with it, so to say. Nice, yeah, because I'm yeah, about halfway through it, and I find it pretty fascinating so far. So I'm yeah, it's curious. Not bad. I'm curious to finish it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I guess I will do the next one, which is the ledge. <laughs> Uh, what? <laughs> I'm just laughing at this movie. That's all. Oh. And how over the top the douchebags are in it. I was just gonna say, like, yeah, let me finish the synopsis and we'll get to that. Sorry, <laughs> but uh, the synopsis is a rock climbing adventure between two friends turns into a terrifying nightmare. After Kelly captures the murder of her friend on camera, she becomes the next target of a tight knit group of friends who will stop at nothing to destroy the evidence and anyone in their way. Desperate for her safety, she begins a treacherous climb up a mountain cliff, and her survival instincts are put to the test when she becomes trapped with the killers 20 feet away and above her. Um, but yeah, what Heather was referring to is, oh my god, like, especially, I, I'll, I'll say right now, I did enjoy this movie, but this first act was so fucking cringe. Mm-hmm. The The villains in this film, especially the leader of them, is so fucking over the top and psychotic as shit for and get no this, reason. This guy's from Lifetime Films, like his Christmas Prince, really? Christmas Prince, Prince the Royal Wedding, Christmas Prince, and the Royal Baby are three of his films, along with Now You See Me and Divergent. Wow, yeah, because his he. He looked at this role and goes, I'm going to overact the fuck out of this shit. And he, yeah. It, it was so painful the way he presented everything. But then once you got past that first act and it got to pretty much what the synopsis is telling you about with her being stuck on the mountain, I found those moments to be really good and tense. Yeah, they have, you still have to deal with that annoying ass villain. But Mm-hmm. I still found like once she was there on that mountain, like because for one, this gave me kind of that uh sense that tension and sense of dread as uh the descent did because yes. like rock climbing or mountain uh diving yes. mountain diving, like it gives me that same kind of feeling, just like oh like that's kind of freaky like doing that yeah. type of shit. So I I found that moment like because it becomes kind of a survival film and like yes. yeah I found trying to survive on the side of a mountain uh very intense. Yeah, it was clearly low budget. They're like, we're in Italy, and where we're, you're like, that's Montana. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, that's fine. That's fine. I honestly, I like survival films like these. I like putting myself in the situation of the protagonist, whether it's watching, you know, someone scale Mount Everest or survive a jungle. So this is my guilty pleasure. I find these films very easy to sit through because I know what it's going to be going to start off with how they all got there chaos is going to to occur and somehow hopefully our protagonist makes it um so you know if you like that kind of film this is right up your alley the 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 dude does overact who's the asshole but i will be honest he does make you hate him oh absolutely like he does a good job of being a complete piece of shit so yeah and for a lower budget yet again if you like survival films like this like you enjoy the whole i'm in the wilderness and i don't know if i'm gonna make it I would say it's worth your time. Otherwise, I would say probably not. And some people wouldn't even consider it that much horror. It, they could call it thriller. And honestly, I don't give a fuck to debate labels for this film. Um, it's not available anywhere yet. I assume it will be dropped eventually on Google, Apple, I, Apple iTunes, <laughs> Apple iTunes, <laughs> iTunes, YouTube. <laughs> You know, these. I don't think Shutter will pick up this film. I would no, be shocked, I would, but yeah. I didn't think they would pick up Great White either. So you know what? Good point. Good point. Shutter sometimes 
Shutter sometimes can't see the way. So, you know, you never know True. what Shutter's going to do. Um, so anyway, we'll see what happens. But uh, yeah, we will see. I, I, I think it's, you know, a two ninety nine rental at the moment, yep. personally. Same. Right? All right. No, no. I, this, I couldn't this, even get through this fucking movie. So you're going to have to talk about it. This fucking gem. <laughs> All right. So the movie we're hinting at is Rucker. A trucker attempts to reconnect with his family by killing women who remind him of his ex-wife. Oh, God, this movie was painful. This just... I got 20 minutes in and I was like, I'm sorry, Tim Davis. I understood this is your number one so far of 2022. And I absolutely do mad respect. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Yeah, like I... I just I watched about half of it and I was like, oh, I I gotta stop. And I said, I'm going, yeah, I'm not even gonna go back to finish it. But then I decided, eh, fuck it, I'll finish it. It's a short film, and mm-hmm. why not? I'll just finish it off. And yeah, I just this is extremely low budget. I found the acting to be pretty painful, and especially mm-hmm. because it's kind of like done in a mockumentary sense. And uh, the girl that's doing the documentary of this guy of this trucker. I found her acting to be so wooden and just not that great at all. I did find Rucker to be definitely the best part of this movie. And that's not saying much because I don't think he was that great, but he was definitely <laughs> like what was the highlight of the movie yeah, for me. Yeah. But like, yeah, I just, this it's about basically a mockumentary about this trucker driving around kidnapping women that remind him of his wife and he puts them in the back of his truck and he kills them while this girl films it because she's not freaking out about it which you know makes total sense i mean there's a reason why i guess in the reveal at the end but i'm going it's still like it's yeah it was just yeah no don't don't no, don't waste your money <laughs> yeah obviously scott is it even available anywhere uh yeah i believe it is is it available yep. on the apple itunes <laughs> surprisingly not <laughs> oh man no it's on voodoo google play amazon video microsoft store and spectrum on demand wow yeah so scott's i couldn't even get past 20 minutes but i will i sit through lots of shit it could have just been the day for me that i couldn't do it um no, just just don't, nah, don't yeah do i won't be going back to it no, um not worth it and then finally the sun came out in the province of ontario <laughs> Uh, Cineplex yeah. opened its doors and I bought my tickets to go see Scream 5 and I went on a Tuesday night which is cheap night similar to me um, <laughs> here in Ontario <laughs> 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 and that's how Scott died <laughs> oh my god <laughs> <laughs> and I went wow. And I sat with my oversized popcorn, shoving it into my face like a deer that hadn't eaten in 15 years. And um, I watched the masterpiece that is Scream 5. Uh, A year ago, I said, we didn't need a Scream 5. I stand by that. I did not think it was, it's a a typical Scream film. If you, I, I was listening to Fresh Cuts talk about it today. And, you know, I think Venom and Don and um, Jerry, no, Venom, Don, Mike, sorry, Mike got it right. I think they were 100% on with their criticisms. And now here's the thing. I am one of those people. I have Scream in my top five horror movies. We know that. I just, you guys just listen to the show if you're an avid listener. I love Scream, but I obviously am someone that can point out and be like, yeah, it's not, it's a personal favorite. I don't sit there and be like, oh my God. And especially now that I've watched more movies, I definitely don't think it had the impact that I used to think it had. Um, I think New Nightmare by Wes Craven had a bigger impact, but I digress. Um, I think, that, well, not in our horror community, but I think was more creative. Right. <clears throat> I should clarify that. So, you know, I went into there with pretty low expectations. Scott had done a good job of being like, keep your expectations low. And, and that's a good thing. Scott told me that. <laughs> <laughs> because I had fun enough with it. You know, uh, we're going to talk about it a little bit more in our spoiler section or out of the dark about how we feel about Scream 5 and the upcoming Scream 6. But I will say, A, I'm glad I went to the theater to support them. B, um, you know, it was a comfort screen movie. The two killers, the gentleman, fabulous. I thought he was funny. I thought, to be honest with you, he carried the fucking film with some of his one-liners. But it definitely, for me, uh, wasn't necessary. It was fine. It was entertaining. But do I think it was great? No, I don't. Um, 
but it's a saga that will continue. And I think it's going to go down the realms of, you know, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Halloween and, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street. And that's fine. You know, that's fine. But it was definitely, I'm very glad that Scott prepared me <laughs> for this movie. Mm, yeah. But already I wasn't overly excited. Like, I can't imagine. I honestly really, I, I hope people who were like counting down the days really liked it. Right. Like, I really do. Because, no, I really, like, yeah, I want people that are excited right? for this to come out happy with it. Absolutely. Because if you were really excited and disappointed, that would have fucking sucked. Because yeah. um, the reason I had a good enough time with it is because I had such low expectations. Right. Usually why a lot of things in my life work out. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> Low expectations. Uh so yeah, and then now that we have one more. So anyway, you can find this in the movie theaters and I think it's going to HBO Max for you guys, isn't it? Or something like that. I'm not too sure, honestly. Well, for us it's only available in the theaters right now. So Cineplex yeah, I'll, I'll is I'll check where to it's see available. if it's anything on mine. Um the last film, I don't think uh Scotty's watched this one yet. Nope. So this one is called Student Body, not to be confused with student bodies. And this is basically about a group of high school students who, through um, a misbehavior of a teacher, they get the teacher gets fired and um, chaos in, ensues. And it's a good slasher. Honestly, it's a oh. 88 minute runtime. It kind of set up to know who all the main players are within the 15 minutes. Probably sounds like I'm giving spoilers there, but there's no mystery of like, I wonder who the killer is. Like, <laughs> you would have to be like under a rock the entire time to not put together. You're watching this for some pretty cool one-liners. Some people get killed off who you don't think are going to get killed off. Um, it's actually rather sad in parts, um, but I enjoyed it. And I think that people should check it out if they get a chance to. Kevin Smith's daughter's in this one. Oh, nice. um yeah she does a pretty good job i liked seeing her she's she is a pretty good little actress actually so um hopefully to see her in more things and it is available through uh itunes i'm gonna set up itunes again. <laughs> google voodoo youtube and microsoft store and that concludes what we've been watching for 2022s you're welcome lance langford because i know he's one of the few people that actually listens and takes notes i think we've given you like maybe three that we recommend that you You're actually right. watch. <laughs> um, probably Student Body. I think it's a solid slasher. I think most people have a decent enough time with it. I think Scream 5 is pretty decent. I think Slap Face is pretty decent. And then obviously the other ones are going to really depend on your prefer preference. But um, do not watch the Rec Room. Rec Room. Yeah, yeah. don't watch that or Rucker. No, just, just say no. Sorry, Tim Davis. I love you. But yeah, don't watch the Rucker. <laughs> say no. Like, say no like Scott and I hear no all the time in our DMs. Say no. <laughs> Good Lord. <laughs> Actually, we don't hear anything. Scott, insert cricket. 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 Anyway. So for our older watches, um, I uh, had fallen into the, you know, I always like fall into shit in January. I'm like, that's here with Japanese horror. And this year it was horror. And I watched Jug Face 2013. Scott, have you seen Jug Face 2013? I have not. Man, this shit is lit. You need to watch Jug Face 2013. Huh. It's on my list because I remember you like really telling me I should watch this one. Oh, man. I saw it in the new horror documentary, which is honestly the best watch on Shutters. I don't know why we didn't, we didn't put that on there. We probably should have talked about that one. Oh, well, you, on. I haven't watched that yet. Oh, okay. Well, we'll talk about it when Scott watches it. It's really, really good. Anyway, that's how I, I found this one. Uh, Any One Minute Runtime basically talks about a small Southern like recluse community and the pit that they have there and the sacrifices that they give to it. And it's pretty fucking cool. Um, this one's on shutter. So I totally recommend it. It's a free watch on shutter. You like four core. You're going to enjoy this bad boy. Also watched kill list by Ben Wheatley. Talk about a film that kind of just starts off with heavy dialogue, huh? Uh, I haven't seen it yet. Oh man. Okay. Yeah. So this film starts off with a couple fighting and it's super realistic. Hmm. Like it just, it just basically picks off where this couple is having it out and you're like, and you almost feel like you're kind of like watching an actual couple argue, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, oh, neat. From 2011, I've watched his other stuff recently in a field in England, which I did enjoy. Um, the kill list, I think a lot of people like it. The acting in it is raw and the dialogue is very raw too. It's basically about a hitman 
going down some very, very dark uh, corners with a cult. And it's pretty fucking cool. So uh, those were my two older watches that I really, really enjoyed. And you got a real old one on here. I sure do. Um, yeah, the Shutter dropped a documentary on Boris Karloff. And uh, so when they did that, they decided to drop a bunch of films that Boris Karloff was in. And of course, that being, you know, the Frankenstein movies were a big chunk of them. And I have only seen the original Frankenstein and bits and pieces of Bride of Frankenstein. So I decided to finally watch all the way through 1935's Bride of Frankenstein. And obviously, a lot of people know about this film, so I'm not going to get into too much detail. But uh, at the same time, I found this movie to be extremely enjoyable, well-directed, well-acted, and ended up having like a dark comedy to it that I did not expect when I watched it. I thought it was going to be a little more on the serious side, but there was actually some kind of silly, dark moments to it. Um, And now I can finally say I get the reference to... uh, Young Frankenstein, when Frankenstein's monster walks and in, uh, runs into that blind man, and the blind man spills hot soup on his lap, and he like freaks out. I get where that scene's coming from now because I thought it was in the original Frankenstein until I watched it last year or two years ago now. Uh, so yeah, it was it was in this scene. The Bride of Frankenstein was was in here, nice. um, but yeah, I am glad I finally sat down and watched this. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and uh, yeah, if you haven't watched it yet, like. I know there's probably like very few of us who have not watched it. I highly recommend it. I thought it was just really well done, really entertaining. And yep, just trying to kind of fill in the gaps of my really older watches that I have not seen anything. Look at you, huh, Scotty? Look at yeah. us. I'm watching Full Core and Ben Wheatley. Ben Wheatley. Yeah, I was going to say, like, yeah, that's a total twist for you. Right. I'm, uh, you know, well, I'm just kind of cultured now, you know? like You are. I'm, you're totally cultured. Oh, my God. Like, I'm a pretty big deal in the podcasting community. So. <laughs> totally. Oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> so. <laughs> so big oh my god that's what she said <laughs> that's what she said that's what he said that's what they said that's what they said that's what mm-hmm. they all say that's right that's right what that's what they say so yeah so some great fun older movies that we've been watching uh please check them out they're available shutter um kill is also on shutter as well so these are all shutter watches if you have shutter and you haven't checked out these bad boys please do um shutter has some great variety and uh, you can really check out some cool stuff there so what's new? Um, okay, so Scotty came out on uh, just over New Year's. And the first night he was here, uh, we went to David Buster's, which I already talked about. But when we came back, we Scotty and I like to show each other music. So when he comes out, we'll have a night where we, you know, do something in advance. And then we'll go sit either on my patio or in my basement because it's so fucking cold out. And we're right. like, okay. And we suggest songs and we just suggest songs that we think each other will like, or maybe that will annoy each other or make each other laugh <laughs> or whatever the case may be. And we do that. That's our thing that we do. And he brought to me gunship dark all day. And yeah. that song has been played so much that Spotify. And yes, I still have Spotify. I do. So we'll leave it at that. Um, <laughs> moved it to my third most repeated fil- song that I've been listening to. Oh, wow. That's how much I enjoyed it. Uh, it's such a great, great song. And so like- to give a concept of why, um, there's a chick in it that's not usually in the, um, the song, right? Yeah. Like in the rest of the music. Yeah. In the rest of the music. Right. And the video is basically based on like a horror movie and they talk about Lost Boys and the and the sax player from Lost Boys is in it, I believe. Yep, he actually is playing the sax in the song. Right? And some of those, like, some of the lyrics are like, I'll see you on the other side. It's so good. Um, Call me Lost Boys, let's stay alive. Let's fly. <laughs> and she's covered in blood and shit and smashing around in blood in the in the video. It's great. But yeah, Scott, how did you come across this group? Because it's your choice. Um, it was my buddy, uh my buddy Zach had come into town about two years ago now, and he was just like, Hey, you're a huge horror movie nerd, so I gotta show you this band. Um, and he showed me one of their songs called Tech Noir, which is a claymation video that has a John Carpenter intro. And it's all claymation and like totally retro 80s. This band is like a synth uh, synth wave style band that focuses on a lot of 80s stuff, but has just like this really awesome beat to it. Um, I think when I described it to you, I, I said like this was uh, my type of driving music where I just let it just kind of like just want to drive at night and just chill and just have like, you know, go on a road trip. And so, yeah, he introduced me to Tech Noir, that song, and I fucking loved it. So I started just kind of going down a YouTube rabbit hole and 
found more of their videos and then dark all day popped up and I'm going, Oh my God, this song is amazing. And yeah, I've listened, Tim and I have listened to this a ton while we're like cleaning the house and stuff like that. And then, yeah, became one of my favorites. So I had to like inter- introduce it to you and I'm glad that you really freaking dug it. Oh yeah. I love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. So what's your song that you're bringing to you talk about? All right. So I'm, uh, I got to give a shout out to our good friends uh, from the Horror for Dummies. They have talked about this band a couple different times. So I finally decided, all right, they keep referencing these guys. I'm going to go check them out and see what they're, because I'd never heard of them, never heard their music. And that band is Ice Nine Kills, which is a American heavy metal band uh, from uh, Baltimore. And, uh, or no, from, sorry, Boston, Massachusetts. Boston. Um, but uh, the first song that I came across was called Hip to Be Scared. And <laughs> Funny. these guys are a horror movie band. Like they do every one of their music videos is a horror film on screen for like the, mm-hmm. how long the song is and always references like some well-known horror, horror movie or character. And in this one, Hip to Be Scared. Well, it references American Psycho because Hip to be Squared was played in that movie. So they just switched it around, Hip to be Scared. And the main character is dressed in a raincoat and like a business suit, kind of like Patrick Bateman is in American Psycho. And it's like extremely violent. It's really, he- it's like pretty awesome heavy metal. Like the music and the lyrics, the music is great. The lyrics are entertaining. And uh, the guy's voice is really catchy. And yeah, I just really dug the shit out of the song and fell into, once again, a YouTube rabbit hole with them. And mm-hmm. started listening to all sorts of other songs of theirs. They they have one that's like referencing Scream. They have one that references Freddy Krueger. They have one that mm-hmm. references uh, Child's Play. Like, and every one of them are these like extremely violent horror films for like five minutes on screen for their songs, and it's freaking awesome. That's cool. I'll have to check them out too. Yeah, I, I think you would like them. I know you're not like a huge heavy metal person, but I think you would like them by the because of the guy's voice. Well, the darker I go down this rabbit hole, the darker I become, Scott. Oh, yes. <laughs> We're getting there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so that's our, that's our, you know, top half of our episode. We will be trying to keep our episodes shorter. So you may notice our main topic, we moved through it a little bit quicker uh, moving forward. But because I think a lot of people really do value the what we've been you know, what's new, which is what we've been listening to, us talking about films that we've watched in 2022s. I do think that's the preferred. Um, yeah. But we will we will talk a little bit about the films that we watched, but I don't think we'll go into deeper analysis of them that we're used to. As we say, we want to try to keep our shows to a shorter length. So um, this is the point where we would take a little bit of a break. So after these messages, we'll be right back. Cha-cha. This is a test of the emergency podcasting system. Listen to the Psychosemantic Podcast. Politics, movies, and political movies. Find us on Facebook, iTunes, Stitcher, legionpodcasts.com, the Psychosemantic Podcast. And welcome back. So as a request from our loyal listeners we were suggested to do international horror so we just started to start with spanish horror now scott and i have actually watched a fair amount of spanish horror films we will be doing a top five and we do have a special guest in mind that we'll be asking for that um but we tried to pick some i think there was the three here we hadn't seen and i had no two eat no okay you had seen one i had seen one yep and then there were three that each of us were first time watches yep. so uh, we did try to do a little bit of a variety, a little bit different stuff than what we had seen before. For example, we saw Terrified. Both of us really liked that. We, we covered that with Dave C. Um, the Shrewd's Nest. You know, there's a couple of ones that really do stand out, of ones that we really, really enjoyed. Uh, but the first one is going to be a movie that was very near and dear to my heart that I got Scotty to watch. So we're Jeez. just going to generally talk about our emotions with these film, what we think is different that Spanish films capture for us personally. Um, and what kind of stood out that would be different maybe than what we would see in North American film. Um, if anything, right. It's just our own personal perspective. So, yeah. so Scotty, go ahead. All right. So first I want to just give a uh, thank you to the suggestion from Don and Ellie. Uh, oh, yeah. Cause, Cause yeah, we asked for theme ideas and he was this one. He suggested he, he called it horrors around the world. So yeah, mm-hmm. we're just going to do a couple episodes focusing on different uh, countries and some of their films. 
Uh, so, yep, we decided Spanish this time. For and America, we're just going to do the purge because we feel like yes. that sums up America. America. <laughs> I mean, we've done enough American that we don't need to do that. We could do a Canadian mm-hmm. one, though, because we have not done a Canadian episode yet. We could. That's true. That's true. Um, but, uh, yeah, the first film that Heather is talking about uh, is The Orphanage, uh, released October 11th, 2007. Laura has happy memories of her childhood in an orphanage. She convinces her husband to buy the place and help her convert it into a home for sick children. One day, her own adopted son, Simone, disappears. Simone is critically ill, and when he is still missing several months later, he is presumed dead. Grief-stricken Laura believes she hears spirits who may or may not be trying to help her find the boy. Wow. Um, so yeah, you've obviously seen this film, so this was my first time watch. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Holy shit, what a heavy film. Right. Like I like i I was pretty much glued to the screen on this one. Uh the obviously it's always hard to uh to tell how well the acting is when it's a different language film. Yes, of course. But I felt like just with like the physical acting and just like everything about like like their tone and everything I felt was like really good acting and man this had some very creepy moments like the whole uh I forget what the game is called but where they're it's pretty much red light red light yeah. green light go um and the one two three knock on the wood yeah turn around one two three knock on the wood right? yeah that that moment when she was doing that with these ghost children was so creepy the way it yeah. was set up like and it wasn't done in your typical American jump scare fashion it no. was just like you turn around and it's just they're there. It's like turn around yeah. again, they're closer. Yeah. It's like I just found like, and I find like this story. Like I said, it's very he- I, like I'm all over the place right now because I'm trying to like yeah put it all together. But I don't want to. Are we? Yeah, I'll say we usually do spoilers. Oh it's yeah, been we'll, so long. We will be spoiling these movies. So the movies that will be covered on this, we're going to introduce them. We're going to give a synopsis of them, and we will spoil it. So if you don't like spoilers, you may want to fast forward. Okay. Yep. Yeah been a while since we did this episode been a while (laughs) while. um but yeah i i the reason i say this is a very heavy film is uh yeah uh what is her name uh laura every single time like this whole entire time she's like she believes simone is still around and like that these ghosts are trying to tell her where he is and you know he ends up disappearing because he basically follows these ghost kids into a cave is what is presumed and that is where the, the the authorities think He drowned because the high tides came in and came into the Mm -hmm. cave and drowned him. And you later find out that, no, uh, unfortunately, Simone was playing basically hide and seek or just being a curious kid who went into a closet, which had a secret door that Laura had no idea was there. And when he went in there, these giant metal bars slammed down against the door, trapping him in there. And it's like this whole basement like area that they had no idea was even there. Mm-hmm. and you would like in the way it just kind of ties in and she like realizes what's going on she's hearing these noises and that she's thinking are ghosts no these noises were her son trying to like scream for help and like banging Get out, out of this the door and, yeah oh it is so heavy when she comes across his body like yes i was devastated my jaw hit the floor i'm going what the fuck like i thought this was gonna be more scary horror like but no, yeah. this is just like that, just real horror. And it's like, fuck. And and the ghosts in this aren't necessarily upsetting. The ghosts are children. Yeah. Um, And the whole basis is, so she was at the orphanage. She gets adopted. She leaves. When she leaves, there's this other kid that comes. It's a woman that comes to work there and her son is deformed. And he wears yes. a bag on his head because he gets made fun of. And he is the one that's kept in the basement area. He stays down there and he draws and he does all his stuff. So he befriends Laura's son, Simone, the ghost does. And the ghost shows him that secret space. And that's what happens where he gets um, your, the situation that you're talking about. There's an open house. Dressed. He goes down there. Some stuff falls over. Laura bo- blocks the... She puts stuff up that fell, which prevents him from getting out of the closet yes actually right and you know the layer of it and then obviously if we go back in time this kid ran away and drowned because of the trauma from these other kids and even though that was an accident the kids were just playing the woman poisons poisons them and for me the hardest part of this film is when you have the medium that goes into the room so laura finds out that the woman that used to work there 
had poisoned these kids who she blamed for her deformed son's death. Mm-hmm. And I, forgot, I forgot to mention that. Yeah. The medium is, is, you know, goes into her medium state and she goes into the room and all you hear is the children crying and her reacting to nothing, but react like this actress was fucking incredible. Cause I believed that she was seeing these kids. Right. And that she was watching them suffer and being super sick. Um, the husband doesn't buy into any of this. Laura buys into all of it. And I think that the difference with Spanish horror when it comes to ghost films to North American films is you were right. This isn't jump scares. This isn't the fucking conjuring. This isn't the fucking turning. We're not dealing with right. What we're dealing with is a subtlety of grief, abandonment, sadness. And when those kids show up at that part where the one, two, three knock on the wood and she turns around and she sees the ghosts and it takes a while for them to show up. Yeah. Like she knocks at least three or four times. All you see is their eyes and they get closer and she chases one of them. To, and the one takes her to where the closet is and takes her down to where her son is. And it's her son ghost that reveals himself to her. And then she's in a whole different realm. And then she realizes that her son died and she's holding a skeleton and it's, and she takes sleeping pills. And the ending scene of this film is fuck. Like, I don't know. you got to be a monster if it doesn't pull from your feels because yeah. it is so traumatic of the innocence that was lost by everyone involved. And also there's a death scene where the woman who was responsible for all that gets hit by a car. Yeah. That's probably the most jump scary part of it because you right. don't see it coming. Yeah. Just like Spanish films tend to like hit on like a heavier subject mm-hmm. with like, uh, like we'll get into it with different, like the different countries talk about it, but yeah, like the way they do it, they, they usually discuss heavier subjects without a lot of violence, usually. No, I would agree with you. And they don't have what we would consider a traditional happy ending. You could argue yeah. that this is a happy ending. Like, yeah. because she is, so Laura, um, and again, spoilers here, once she realizes everything that has occurred, she takes sleeping pills and she overdoses on them because she just wants to be with Simone. Yeah. She dies, Simone is there, and all the children are there. And the children are happy that Laura is there and that she will take care of them for the rest of the time. And it ends with her reading them a story and caring yep. for them, right? So, yep. And the geez. one thing I... Oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. I was saying the one thing I wanted to bring up that they uh, kind of hint at this a little bit by uh, like kind of this ending by at the, in the kind of in the beginning when they are talking about Peter Pan and the Lost Boys. Yes, absolutely. Very that's good exactly tie-in. what this is. It is a very good tie-in. And her, whether she's Wendy or not, and him talking about, I won't live very long. And he has HIV, just to be clear. He has HIV. So right. he's, you know, he has this disease that obviously, you know, unless you're Magic Johnson, but this is not, you know, <laughs> 2022. Um, right. You know, this is a, obviously... A little dated, not overly dated, but probably this kid doesn't have the medicine to make him live till 90. So he's already believing that he won't live long. And this movie is just a very romantic ghost story of love, but not necessarily about her love with her husband. She does clearly love her husband and he does clearly love her and they are very happy together. And he does kind of go along with this stuff, but eventually it gets too painful for him. Yeah. But even when she dies, he does a beautiful memorial for her And he knows she is at peace with the kids and Simone. And I feel like that is a, that is a realm that international films do specifically Spanish films where they can look at an ending that is not overly happy because not everybody gets what they want, but it's happy. Yeah. You know, and it's kind of like bittersweet. Right. right? And I think the orphanage does that well to show that happiness doesn't involve her being with her husband and everything is great for her. Happiness was her being with Simone and these other children. That was happiness was her leaving this world and being able to care for them in the afterlife. And I think that was really reflective of this movie. And, you know, obviously we've spoiled it. So hopefully if you've listened to this point, you're aware of that. But that's the difference between a Spanish ghost story, in my opinion, and a um, North American one. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Like there there are definitely like huge differences between like how countries do their movies, like especially in the same genres. And yes. Well, yeah. And I think we could move to our next one because this one is very much a psychological outbreak kind of film. Um <laughs> done very like, differently. This is a, a strange one right here. But uh yeah. this movie is uh The Similars, released September twenty fifth, twenty fifteen. 
Eight people experience a strange phenomenon while waiting for a bus at a remote station on a rainy October night. Oh, wow. So <laughs> I will say right off the bat, this feels like a full length Twilight Zone uh, mm -hmm. episode. Um, but uh, I have to right off the bat say the way this is like filmed is so beautiful and stylistic. Kind of gives me a more subtler version of Sin City vibes. Like it's got like this like black and white, but with mm -hmm. also uh, toned down hues of colors for certain things. Mm -hmm. And it's just very beautiful and like kind of gives me a like a noir feel. Yes. Yes. I like that. That's a good description, Scott. And like it's very. Yeah. And it just so like it basically starts off and these people are uh, just like trapped in this bus station and they're mm -hmm. and it's like raining out and they're hearing like stories of how this rain is like causing like basically to quarantine yourselves because of this mm -hmm. rain and they're going what the hell's going on and they're all trying to get to Toleta Loco I think it was yeah I think like so. a hospital and uh, yeah, I think everyone was destined for that destination. And then all of a sudden, like, they run into somebody who collapses and starts foaming at the mouth, like having epileptic seizures. So you're thinking it's some type of weird, like, disease slash virus. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, like, everyone's paranoia is up and not trusting who is infected and who isn't infected. And, like, uh, it's got an interesting cast of characters. Very interesting. Um, then there you run into one guy that's his face is all bandaged up mm -hmm. and he's like oh it's itchy gotta take this off gotta take this off so he starts <laughs> taking the bandage off and he's like i don't know what's happened but i've shaved and shaved and shaved and it keeps coming back and he looks exactly like another character in this movie mm -hmm. like and he's like freaking out going what the hell why do i look like you you why what's going on and then you start realizing the people that are having these epileptic seizures are slowly transforming into this guy yeah and it is so weird and like kind of creepy because like it's these weird like these masks don't look realistic that are like I mean they do but they don't on their face just uh what is that called the uh uncanny valley is how I feel yeah. like you're looking at it going they look real but not quite right and yeah. like it's yeah but yeah everyone is similar and I mean fuck a pregnant woman has a baby and the baby comes out with a full fucking beard and like looking like this guy. It's crazy. And, and there's a dog that shows up that has a beard with the guy's face on it. It's like, what the fuck is going on? It's, uh, and there's this little boy that has like this contraption around him that he's constantly getting this like thing injected into him. Mm -hmm. And when he doesn't get his medicine, he like goes kind of crazy. And like, it's almost like, the power of his imagination is causing all of this to happen. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. it becomes like an epidemic where it's like, or a pandemic where it's just happens across the entire world. Like they're talking about how in the U S mm -hmm. there's people with Mexican, this Mexican guy's face on them. And like, like and uh, what was it? I think even in Japan and like, it was just talking about like, you hear these little clippets on yeah. the news. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and even when they look at pictures, like posters and stuff like that, the people's faces are now all of a sudden this guy's face. Yeah. And no, it's totally weird. It's very weird. And I feel like this movie, A, it's our art house film. It's a Spanish yeah. art house film. And I love that it's filmed in black and white. It gives it that classic, almost 1950s science fiction feel to it. Yeah. What I also really appreciate about this movie is it talked about a simulation. And it talked yeah. about the fact of us all becoming the same, uh, the fear of water and rain and how that affects everybody and no one is safe. And the power of this one kid's imagination or one person to create a concept that spreads across the world. And if we look at, you know, even stuff recently that have happened with the Spotify and Joe Rogan and all that other things, that's, that's an example of one person's perceptive of people wanting to be like Joe Rogan, um, wanting to do that alpha male stuff, believing in his COVID um, beliefs and what he presents and people wanting to be that. Like he is somebody that I think if people could trans transfer their face into like what we see in this movie, they would do that. Like there is, he does have very much of cult following. And I feel like this movie talks about that concept. Yeah. It talks about the concept of becoming the same person. God, you're so much smarter than me. <laughs> <laughs> Stop it. I'm like, I'm sitting here Stop going, I'm like, I'm like, I like this movie. It's weird. <laughs> and you're like, oh, there's all these different themes here. And I'm like, <laughs> 
huh well yeah, that's because right. i like social themes let's be clear here <laughs> i'm not smarter than you i just like social themes <laughs> and you know and it could be whoever was making this was also like hey fuck let's just make everyone look like this dude fuck yeah high fives like it doesn't necessarily mean <laughs> right. it that's what i took from it right and what i thought was really interesting was the power of one person's imaginations or one person's thought to change everybody to be this perspective yeah um and the kills like there's some really creepy bathroom scenes and like oh yeah. shit that happens like it is and and being filmed in black and white almost gives it a higher creep factor especially in 2015 you know we don't see that as much film like the lighthouse did it and i know there's some other films that have done it but i i, I found it really more effective here yeah, like, uh, and it's because I think one thing that makes it a little more effective is just because they do have that subtle use of color for certain things, like yes. the woman, yes. the woman stabbing her face when it turns into the guy's face, and like the blood is like a mm-hmm. muted red, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but it's like, but it's still just like, oh, it makes it more effective. Like it does. Yeah, it is more sure. visually striking. Um, one thing I also want to bring up though is uh, like I guess this is kind of a thing I picked up on is uh, the uh, power of this shows the power of a child's imagination. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Because obviously children have a much broader imagination than us as adults. And I, yeah, good so observation. I, 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 I kind of took that from that. That's like about the only thing I took from it. But like, I, besides like a artsy Twilight Zone movie that's just very interesting and fun. I think Twilight Zone is a great example of what this movie was trying to do. And maybe the political message wasn't there. You know, I didn't right. read enough into this background. That's what I took from it. I mean, it's and a great. A great you know that was my analytical it. side of it it could just be hey let's make a funny almost science fictiony like 1950s film um but we're going to make everybody turn into this and just have a goofy time with it that could absolutely be a case too and even their poster for this movie looks like a science fiction film from the 1950s oh, it, it totally and does so you know it's but those all also had political reasons to them too right so you know it, it could definitely be that but i think what i really enjoyed for the spanish film is you know i feel like if this was a north american film and i know i sound like i'm shitting on north american films and i'm not there's some great north american films that have original concepts that come out really really well done but i think what i i, I liked more about this one is the characters were so authentic and the ending yeah. was yet again not really a happy ending like it wasn't like and everyone's okay it's like well now everyone looks like this bearded dude and this kid's just gonna like run the world with his imagination and i i really respect movies that do that i really yeah. respect movies that don't try to and and they leave the movie up for interpretations they don't spoon feed you they're not like and then this is what happened and this is the conclusion you should take from it and I do think more modern age directors are doing that. Like, for example, Adi Aster's Midsommar. You yeah. can interpret that ending however you want to interpret it, right? But I think that's more of a new thing. I think that Spanish films and under other international films are not afraid to leave the audience going, well, things didn't end up how you thought it was going to be. So right. now you interpret this. And I think that I really respect that about this film, the interpretation yeah. that you're able to take from it. I completely agree. Like, I think the way they did that, like, the way they handle certain films is very interesting. Yeah, and um, it kind of falls in, actually, the panic and, you know, the multiple characters interacting and, and turning on each other, though definitely presented here, wasn't as strongly presented in the next movie we're going to talk about. Ah, good segue. Right. Uh, so, yeah, the next movie we are going to talk about is The Bar, released February 15th, 2015. Directed by, I think it's uh, Alex de la Iglesias. Uh, he is the uh, guy that we ended up, when we had our good friend Xander Kane on, he was the director of uh, that De la Bestia movie. <laughs> that was such a um, funny movie. This guy has also done like a bunch of a more, uh, The Last Circus, uh, what was it, Witching and Bitching. Like he's done some really awesome films. And when I, I didn't realize this was his film, but I was like, man, this this kind of feels like his type of film. And then all of a sudden at the end, like I seen his name pop up as the director. I'm going, oh, no shit. <laughs> so that's cool. That was, that was a nice surprise. But uh, I'll read the synopsis real quick. In bustling downtown Madrid, a loud gunshot and two mysterious deaths trap a motley assortment of common urbanites in a decrepit central bar, while paranoia and suspicion force the terrified regulars to turn on each other. All right. So this one, I, I had so much fun with this. Oh, man, um, what a good film every character in this once again like unique characters that all stand out and like you can relate with them to an extent mm-hmm. but uh mm-hmm. 
yeah, it's like you kind of like the film starts off with everybody just kind of like separately in Madrid, just kind of walking down the street or driving or in the bar or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they all just end up showing up at this bar at just on happenstance. Um, and all of a sudden, yeah, like you, like uh, the synopsis says, they hear a loud gunshot and they look outside and there's a dead body right in front of their, uh, right in front of the bar. Someone goes out there to try to rescue the guy. He gets shot. Yeah. And what you find out is earlier in the film, a guy walks in and like coughing his lungs out, runs into the bathroom and locks the door. This guy used to be a military person and was infected with some type of disease. And so uh, apparently uh, the policia would be, uh, were called to quarantine the facility and uh, pretty much shoot anybody that tried to escape the bar or that was near the bar. And it's forcing everybody inside to turn on each other because now they're like, okay, who's infected? Who's not infected? You you must be infected because you touched the body, this and that. And like, yeah, each of these characters go from, ah, oh, like besides one of them, almost every one of the characters is like, oh, I kind of like this guy. Oh, what an asshole. I can't believe they did this. I think mm -hmm. the only one that never like, had a flip-flop style personality was the main woman. Yeah, the main protagonist. Yeah. She was probably the one that was consistent. Um, because I agree with you. And I and I really like how they took a they brought the panic naturally. So when I look at the sim the simulam the slimiters, the simulators, I'm not saying it right. Uh similars. Thank you. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> um and the bar, the first one was made for a film festival. That was what yeah. that was made for, right? This one is definitely made for Netflix and definitely made for general distribution because it's a concept that anyone from any country can get. You're in a bar, someone gets shot. You can't leave. You can't figure out what's going on. And they go through the stages of trying to figure out why they're being shot at before they even figure out the infection piece. Yeah. Then they figure out the infection piece. Then they're divided. And it's really interesting to see how they turn on each other. And I think for me, the film really picks up because at one point there's a group of four people that have been decided that they could be infectious and they are sent to the cellar. And... <laughs> Even though it is such a minute issue compared to the excellent dialogue that takes place, whether people should be removed from the bar or not, or who should trust who, which is great. It just wasn't there. Like, I just, that wasn't my investment point because I've seen that in too many movies so far. And especially since we've had COVID-19, I feel like every infection movie has that now. Has a, you have it, no, you have it, you have it. That's, that's just my perspective. And this is nothing against when this movie came out in 2015. What I thought was really fascinating and probably where I'm going to show that I'm not the smart one of this podcast is when they were trying to get through this ridiculously small hole in the <laughs> sewer and greasing themselves up with olive oil and trying to take turns pushing each other through. And honestly, I had more anxiety in those <laughs> scenes because you can see the skin being cut. You can see the pain in people's faces as they're trying to be squeezed through this tiny, tiny sewer and I found that more upsetting than almost anything else, to be honest with you. Yeah, like, because it, it, you can feel it, because, like, you, it's like, okay, because I'm sure we've all had an experience where, like, when we were younger or something, we crawl somewhere and we feel like we might be stuck, so we have to wiggle a little bit, and it mm -hmm. kind of freaks you out a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, like, for one, I can't believe they looked at this hole and goes, yeah, on that, because it's like, oh, that is, you, no, no human body should fit through that. Like, uh, that looks extremely painful, and you are going to get tore the fuck up when you do it. Um, especially the, uh, the homeless guy, like, uh, like who I actually felt really bad for at first. Yeah. He was a crazy drunken homeless guy, but mm -hmm. like, like he seemed to almost have kind of like a moral sense of purpose to him at first. Yeah. But then as things kind of went on, it, it escalated, but, uh, but yeah, like when they were trying, when he was like, oh yeah, I can fit. So he starts taking all his clothes off and greases himself up and slides down there and he gets stuck at the halfway point and you're seeing them push or you see them trying to pull him back up by grabbing under his chin and pulling his head it's like oh you could rip this freaking head off like, oh yeah oh. like you feel the empathy or when they finally get the woman through yeah you see the oh. blood coming down and then they oh. make the space bigger and then there's an older woman who kills herself out of basically saving those guys like the rest of yeah. the people that are there and it's a really emotional scene like there this movie went from being funny to to emotional to funny to emotional to, oh my God, I can't believe they just did that, to cringy, to like, oh my God, are they really going to do that? Like it was, it was such a everything in one mixed bag. It That's really, really was. And, and everything, it did everything well. It did everything well. Yeah. Like nothing was done poorly. The lines that were supposed to be funny that were delivered were funny. The, the parts where you were supposed to be uncomfortable, you were uncomfortable. 
the parts where you felt empathy or sadness, you felt those things. And I, I thought that the ending to me, where we only have our one person that makes it out um, and how people don't like, they're just like, Oh yeah. yeah. They they, they look at her and just walk off. But then like you, because especially like the first part of that, when she's just walking down the street, she's in her bra. And I think just like pants and just bloody and filthy. And everyone's just looking at her and just keeps walking, minding their own business. But then as the credits are rolling, you're seeing like people coming up and putting a coat around her and like seeing like some like actual general yeah, nice like people someone out puts there. a jacket around her but they still aren't addressing it right and that is the most realism thing i have ever fucking seen in film in a long time yeah because that is exactly what would happen um no one would do shit right no. and maybe eventually somebody would uh but generally speaking people are very self-absorbed and be like well it's not my business <laughs> <laughs> and right. I thought that that was really, really well done. This film is very much made for, I would say, mass audience, um, an international audience, because it's so, you know, the plot is so easy to follow. It's not overly complicated. It's it's not overly cultural referenced. Um, you know, anyone can represent with what's going what's going on here. So I see why Netflix picked it up. It's a very um, palatable movie, but it's a very, very strong mixed bag of everything. Yeah, like um, the one thing I have noticed about this director is like he gets like great act, uh, great acting performances out of his uh, or great performances out of his actors, and because everyone I thought did a great job, like I didn't Absolutely. find anyone painful or anything, uh, and I feel his movies, besides maybe some of his earlier stuff, almost have like an American tinge to them. Yes, yes, that's a good way to look. Like at Like a very pal, like it's yes. very palatable for Americans that are not yeah. usually into these. And type Canadians, of films we'll say North them. Americans. Yeah, yeah North you Americans. Know, same yeah. thing. Yeah. But like, I feel like a lot of his movies are a little more palatable mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. like the general North American audience compared to most like Spanish films because they are, they do you. feel more like an American film but done in Spanish with a Spanish twist. Yeah, like mass 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 cultured, and I think that the last one we're going to talk about. You know, so far all the films made sense for where we had to find them. The Orphanage was, um, you know, very much a modern, I would say very international ghost story too. You can kind of yeah. pick up on it. Um, the sim- the similars were, you know, very much a film festival, Spanish related, cultural one. Um, we just talked about the mass marketing value of the bar. And the final one, I get why Shutter picked it up. And I get why this was a Shutter thing and why Netflix didn't. And why Prime, in my understanding, Prime hasn't, that it's just on Shutter. Yeah, I believe um, it is. And I and I think there's a really good reason why. So I'll let you introduce it and we can discuss our last film. All right. So our final film is Tigers Are Not Afraid, released September 24th, 2017. Uh, this is a uh, story about a girl when a girl's mother disappears, leaving her on her own. She goes and joins a gang of street children, leading to a tragic chain of events. Um. This one is definitely a more uh, hard, realistic look at what has been happening in Mexico with the drug cartel Mm -hmm. and everything like that, pretty much running the country and how it's like destroying families and lives and just it's very this is probably one of the this is probably the heaviest film we've got on our list. Yes, for today. For sure. For sure. And. I will admit when I watched this for the first time, I thought it was okay. I didn't, it didn't really hit me watching it this time though. Fuck. Like this was just a hard hitting film. Like I, I see why a lot of people had it on their list, like at the end of the mm-hmm. year, cause this was very strong film. And I believe this may have even been a first time director, but I not too sure at the top of my head, but um, yeah. So like you pretty much this starts off with, uh, you seeing uh, the kid, like all these kids in school and a pretty much a school shooting happens where it's, I think it's just drug cartel coming in and shooting up the place. And mm-hmm. this teacher gives this little girl, these three pieces of chalk that are basically use these to have three wishes. And, uh, then she goes home later that day and realizes her mom's not there and her mom has been kidnapped and sold off by the drug, te- uh, the drug cartel. And so she's just living at home, like not able to like fend for herself and like starting to starve. And she just comes across this gang of street children that have like pretty much lost their homes that have learned to survive on the streets. And these kids are all like, what would you say? Like maybe 10 years old, 11 years old, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so it's already hard to watch that. Like, it's just like, they are just poor little things. Like trying to learn how to survive and Mm -hmm. the leader of this gang ends up uh stealing a phone and a gun from one of the big gang members 
Mm -hmm. And this phone has some evidence on it for the leader of the gang. And so it ends up being a story of this gang chasing down these children and will do anything they can to get this phone, meaning kill them. They don't care. They are ruthless killers. And it is so fucking heartbreaking watching what goes on in this film. And it's, it's got it. Like it's a very real story and it's got just like a, just enough of a supernatural twist to make this like a, like not just straight real horror, like, like make this gives it like the horror element to it. I think. Yes. I there agree. is like a ghost that the ghost of the mother mm-hmm. and the mother helps get revenge for her daughter mm-hmm. with these, when she, whenever she uses those wishes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah, like, I know this is the first time watch for you. So how about you? What are you your know, thoughts? I, I avoided this film for years because I did not want to watch kids get hurt. Yeah. Um, I heard Venom do a review on it on Fresh Cut. So I had a general idea of what happened. I avoided it because I don't like bad things happening to children. Now, you know, you probably wonder then, well, why do I like the orphanage so much? That is a very clearly a ghost story. This fucking yeah. shit happens. And yeah, this is real. Um, I have a very hard time knowing that this happens to children, that it happens to people. And I understand there, you know, we have tragedies in North America too, but the Mexico city is a very dangerous place. And I avoided this film because of that until Scott chose it, which I'm glad because you need to eventually watch movies, even if they make you uncomfortable, in my opinion. Yeah. So I thought this movie, A, the children actors are fucking out of this world. Oh, um, incredible. Incredible actors and actresses. I I really enjoyed the character of Shine. I thought that yes. he was a young man who obviously cared a lot, but was very hardened. And I didn't think they were annoying. I didn't think these kids are like the typical, no. like fucking Oliver Twist, like pickpockets, you know, like it was more of like what they had to do to survive with other gangs on the street and stuff. And yeah. the concept of the three wishes, her mother's ghost, like this, this story is so emotional. It, it pulls in the violence. It pulls in the reality of living on the streets and this gang fucking mercifully going after these kids like no mercy no compassion nothing and the young lady is an excellent protagonist there's a part where she's been tasked with killing somebody and she doesn't have to do it because the person's already dead um and it's it gets her entrance into this gang And even the part where she's sitting alone in the apartment waiting for her mom to come back and her mom doesn't. It's so sad. Is She just nails it. And the the ending of this, and I know I'm jumping ahead, but everyone dies, basically, except for our main protagonist. Yeah. And she comes across a tiger. And they talk about the tiger's legend of the tiger living in the street that takes children and stuff. And she's able to walk past this this tiger and lead, and lead and lead to a better life like it's probably the most upbeat ending out of all the films we watch in <laughs> yes. the sense that like you get the idea that this young lady made it pass and the ghosts in this are yet again not oh, boogity 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 it's, right. <laughs> it's like they're there you know they're there you know it's coming and you're not using music and jump scares to pull any punches here and i think this movie is just such a good rec- reflection of what you do in situations where you have no choice and you have to do what you need to do to survive and how vicious and cruel cartels can be, you know, yeah. and, and that lifestyle can be. I think it didn't hide its dirty side of Mexico City, and I really respect that. Uh, too often, I think movies or countries push aside their um, trauma. I think we deserve more movies on what we've done respectfully to the native Americans indigenous populations in both of our countries, particularly in the residential schools. And I think we shouldn't hold back. And I think we should show exactly what happened because I think as white people, we need to, and yeah, white people, I'm just going to say it as white settlers. I think we need to fucking know what our ancestors did and it was wrong. And I think that this is an example of showing like, Hey, we got fucking problems. (laughs) Yeah. Like, well, there's a problem here. And this is what's happening. And and they're giving it a little bit of a happier ending because they want to give hope. But I think that they don't hide it. And I really respect that about this film. Yeah, because this this is one of those films where you're watching it and going, Wow, uh this, this could get you in trouble type of shit. Because it's showing you like how real it is. Yeah. And right? like it's crazy. I I uh so I can hear that. Yeah, I can hear it. I don't know what the fuck's going on with my phone. It's been randomly playing like Music, I don't know from where. There's no way to turn it off. Is it gunship? 
no it, it's just some random like groovy tune for a split second and then disappears and there's nothing playing in the background on my phone i don't know i think my phone must be fucking haunted because <laughs> i don't you know, know what's what, going we're on talking about ghost movies with tigers are not afraid maybe it's like blaze is not afraid and it's blaze haunting you through the phone right <laughs> blaze uh, but, is scott's uh, lizard everyone no not yeah. that lizard like an actual lizard yeah. that, he, that he purchased no, a but, baby <clears throat> baby leopard gecko he's pretty cute he is adorable. Um, I mean, I wanted to say, like, uh, yeah, this dire- director is uh, Issa Lopez. And uh, from what I've been hearing, sounds like her and Guillermo del Toro are going to be working together on something. And I heard it might be like a werewolf western type movie, which I'm very curious about that concept. I'd be interested to see her perspective on this because it's very much written from a female perspective, um, especially what happens with the mother um, and the little girl. I, I think that it makes sense that it was a female well, I guess she didn't write it. She directed it, but it definitely. Well, she wrote and directed it. I and think. she wrote it. Okay. I think so. Um, I think it really does give that flair um, of that storytelling piece. And man, like a heavy film. I'm going to have to watch it again. And I, and I want to give a shout out to Venom. I believe this was his number one mm-hmm. the year that it came out and every right for it to be. It's a fucking phenomenal film. Yep. And I also looked it up. She is director, writer, and producer. Wow. So Woman yeah. in Horror. Woman in Horror right. Month. There's an example of it right there. Exactly. And yeah, I but... think this makes sense for Shudder. It is a very dark film. This is something that I don't think a Netflix would pick up. It's not as poppy gum. Woo, like this is this is raw. And it's yeah, not this is funny like your... or silly. It's it's very raw. Right. It's a real hard look at reality. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. excellent and, film though yeah i'm glad that you finally uh we decided to cover this and got you to watch it because I, I knew this was one that you were avoiding but i'm glad that you did enjoy it and like even though it was a heavy film absolutely and you know what you gotta push sometimes you gotta push people to watch stuff um that you know so they can experience what other films are out there and even if i have a problem with kids dying in films obviously i don't have that much of a problem with it i've watched serbian film and other shit right um but this one's just different yeah it just feels different it's different when it feels realistic and it's yes. shit that happens i have a hard time with realities hence why the school shooting one bothered me last year yeah. because that shit happens and right. that that really bothered me and you know it we're all different to what we feel but those are that's our short little review of spanish horror films we will be doing a top five uh because scott and i both enjoy a lot of spanish films and mm-hmm. uh, we're hoping to have a very special guest on for that one yeah. Um, so yeah, I hope you guys have enjoyed that and please check out the films uh, if you're interested. And I guess we'll move to our out of the dark um, segment. <laughs> so both of my, Scott and I have seen the Academy Awarding films that are Scream 5. Um, Scott's already shared his opinion. Did you want to add anything else before you got into talking about what you thought about Scream 6? Or do you want to just, because we know now that there's going to be a six one. Yeah, but it's been announced. Um, it's been announced. It's going the way of the Halloweens and Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street franchise and Hell Brazier franchise and Child's Play franchise. It's it's following in the footsteps. Yep. Because uh, it makes the money. Yeah, right? But, so uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, well, on Scream 6 or Scream 5? Oh, both. Whatever you want to say. Yeah, Do you like, want to tie 5 into 6 or just talk about 6? It's up to you. Like, honestly, like I agree with you with what you said earlier. There are scream five was unnecessary and so uh, that's that's all i'll say with that and scream six well i feel the exact same way completely unnecessary um they're just doing this and dragging this out because i mean i'm not gonna say but you know there's still characters alive that probably could get well, we can get spoilers point. everybody there may be some spoilers on screen five and what we think will happen is scream six here yeah i'll put it in the show notes with caution i will definitely be giving the spoiler for scream five all right 110 percent so but yeah, um, basically, okay, so I'll, I'll just jump into it with the spoiler part. Scream 5 definitely set this up for a new series with a group of new characters to follow with a mm-hmm. couple of veterans left alive. Mm-hmm. Legacy um, characters. Yeah, legacy characters. Nice. Uh, anyways, <laughs> um, who, who all should have probably fucking died in this last movie. But anyways, that's the that's <laughs> point. Um but this basically is just a new way of chaperoning in a whole new cast of characters like that will, you know, obviously most of the cast of characters will get killed off and then they'll move on to a new movie and they'll meet new friends. And this girl, like the Billy Loomis's daughter is basically <laughs> going to become the new Sydney Prescott. That's what I fucking see now. And I am 
so fucking over this franchise. <laughs> like, I don't hate it, but I just don't see any point on why to continue unless they decide, hey, Scream 6, these copycat killers are not going to be ghost-faced and try something else and do something creative new. Yeah, but then they can't call it Scream 6. I know, Scott. Scott's like completely... <laughs> He's really excited. I've rolled um, my eyes so hard I seen my brain. There were there were parts. So before I went to the movie, Scott's like, Heather, there's gonna be some lines that you're gonna fucking roll your eyes at. And the whole meta, like Fresh Talks cuts talked about this perfectly. The hey, 1996 called, they want their fucking storyline back. Like yeah, right. Can we stop, please? And the whole evaluated like, about what is it? Oh, elevated. Elevated. Elevated horror fucking storyline and Oh my god, you know, then stop treating fans like they're stupid. We have our love of film. Bam, bam, bam. It's like every annoying, annoying horror fan in the world is in that those these movies. I swear to yeah. God. They're the people that you know take horror movies way too fucking seriously. And you just want to like have a good time and like talk about a film and all they want to do is argue with you about Friday the 13th was fucking better and get into stupid, pointless debates over stupid shit. Right. And they just take all the fun out of it. And I thought Scream 5 was fine for what it was. I thought the Billy Loomis hallucinations was hilarious. I understand that was supposed to be, like, clever. I thought it was dumb. I felt it like it was, like, a Lifetime film. Um, I loved how the, the main chick didn't die in the first opening scene. I thought that was cool and different. Right. Uh, Nev Campbell and Courtney Cox, I hope they got you lots of money because they're mature now. They both look fabulous. But it's ridiculous them coming back. Like, yeah. It is ridiculous. I get why they came back because Dewey's killed everybody. Oh, <laughs> who would have seen that coming? No one knew. Who would um, have expected the guy that's been stabbed and shot in every single movie would eventually be the first one of these three to die? Honestly. So it was fine. The acting was very 90210-ish. The dialogue was very 90210-ish. I just don't understand how they can do a six. I said it at the end of the fourth. Thought that was a great ending. And these cousins fucking jealous that she, you know, wasn't famous. She it played on the whole, you know, I just want to be a YouTube star and not have to do anything. I thought that was great. Emma Roberts was great. Rory McCulkin was great. Like, you had some pretty good fucking actors and young actresses in that film. Yeah. And then I don't know where the fuck they pulled these people out of and what shoe they pulled them off of for gum, but they were just crappy with the exception of the of the boyfriend. He was yeah. the only one that made the movie enjoyable for me, to be quite honest. Yeah, and I, and I really like him in The Boys. So I, when I seen him, I that, that's how I knew he was the, like the killer right off the bat. Because I'm like, oh, famous guy. Well, they're obviously not going to kill him off. Well, and the worst part about him is that they made him be like, I don't know anything about the stab movies. Right. Well, he's a killer. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's not obvious at all. Right. So I just don't know where they're going to go with Scream 6. I don't think you can continue to go with Tara and her sister and their Sam and their lackluster acting skills and their lackluster personality. Um, it was fine. Like for a Scream film, it was entertaining enough. I was entertained by it. I thought it was fine. And you know what? If we're going to go down this realm of multiple, multiple sequels, Texas Chainsaw Massacre's done it. Halloween's Not done it. Child's Play's done it. Nightmare on Elm Street's done it. Here's the difference. It's the same fucking killer mm -hmm. with the exception of Halloween three seasons of The Witch. Yeah. This is a new person every time. Like Venom made a really good point in Fresh Cuts. Like why haven't they banned the cells with the costume of Ghostface right. in fucking Woodsboro by now? Like it's just, it's, it's getting silly. Like it's yeah. getting, and I'm, and I know there's people out there that love the films. I enjoy them. Several of them made it to my top 50 and all of them would be in my top 100, except for five. Um, because I enjoy the franchise, but even I can look at it and go, all right, come on guys. Let's fucking, right. these aren't movies to unpack. Okay. They're right. not, they're not movies to unpack. They're basic concept films. So I'm not excited for Scream 6. Um, nope. I would be one of those characters that wouldn't be excited for Stab 6. I I just I I think it's fine. They'll make money. I hope some young stars make some money off their roles and shit. But it's it's I don't understand where they're going to go from here. But like, I don't understand how they were going to go with the fifth one. So what right. do I know? In my eyes, they've drained the well dry on this franchise. Right. Just, just put it to bed. Like I I mean you know I know there are a lot of fans out there of the franchise. Sure, but 
I'm it's a fan. Just, like well, I'm a fan, yeah. but I I'm not as big of a fan. Like I thought I was a fan, Scott, until I met other people. Exactly. That like eat, live, breathe, die by these films. I'm podcast with one of these people, and and that's fine. You know, yep, you like what you like. A, he has an undying love for these movies, and I respect that. Yeah. I don't like. I treat them like they should. To, to me, not like they should be treated. I shouldn't say that. I treat them like they're fun slasher films. Right. They're fun. Like, especially I think over the last two years, three years of us podcasting and how many other fucking films we've watched, Mm -hmm. it would be pretty hard for me to be like, yeah, Scream. I don't think Scream made the impact anymore that I used to think. Doesn't mean I don't enjoy it. Right. But I don't think it has the legacy to me that it used to. And that's just because I've watched more films and I've found other stuff that I enjoy. Exactly. Like, I completely agree. Like, honestly, like, I'm not a big fan of most franchises anymore just because it's just like, give us something new. Like, we've done this. It's just repeating things because it's making money. At least with the other ones, it's continuous char- characters. Like, honestly, right. if they made a Gremlins 3 and they brought back and they brought back Gizmo, which they should, at least it's fucking consistent. Like, at least right. it's... And at least it's only three movies. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, even with, like, Freddy Krueger, fine. It's him throughout all of them. Jason, fine. Even if he goes to fucking space. Leprechaun, fine. It's <laughs> yeah. him throughout all of them. It's not like, oh, it's Leprechaun, but now there's a bunny and the <laughs> bunny's evil, right? Like it's it, right. it's it's the consistency and people are going back for that character. Ghostface is different every time and they always are making toast ghost case fall, tall and intimidating when they got someone that's like five foot three pointing <laughs> right. them. It makes no fucking sense. Like I agree with Venom and Mike and Don. I can turn off my brain and watch it and be like, nah, man, it's a fucking screen film. But if you're going to sit right. there and be like, oh my God, it's just so clever. No, it's not. It's nope. not clever. It's nothing recycling ab- <clears throat> the same shit from 1996. That's all it's doing. Yeah, I say nothing about this was clever. No. And I doubt Scream 6 will be any different. <laughs> Scream 6 will probably not surprise Scott and I. It's like Halloween Kills has come in this year. and Or Halloween Ends. Oh, sorry. Because Heather, be... Heather, e- evil <laughs> dies in 2022. It does it? <laughs> I, we'll find out. <laughs> oh, doubt boy. it. I doubt oh, it. Boy. <laughs> Honestly, like, and hey, you know what? Yet again, I don't, I like lots of shit that people don't enjoy and love what you love and enjoy what you enjoy, but be honest with it. Like, you know, I, I can walk away from Tusk and be like, I may really like this film and find it fucking hilarious, but I understand why people don't. Right. Right. Like. Don't be like Scream Five. It's like, mwah. <laughs> it comes well, to meta and, fucking horror. Like, and everybody knows my, here. everybody knows my absolute love for Gremlins. But I'm not gonna sit here and go, oh, it's so clever. Look, <laughs> let, me, let me take this apart and dissect it because look at all this unique stuff that was never done. Like, no, it's a fun movie that I highly enjoy, and I'll admit I'm a fucking fanboy. If they come out with a Gremlins Three, fuck yeah, I'll watch it. If they come out with a Gremlins Four, fuck yeah, I'll watch it. But I'll still have a critical eye and go, these are just fun movies. There's nothing to them. Like, like at least with Gremlins, once again, you have to have Gizmo because Gizmo was what creates Gremlins. So once again, a returning character that would be always in the movie. Right. Yeah. I, you and I are on the same page with this one. Yeah. I, hey, you know what? I hope some young stars get their kicks out of this one. I hope they make some money. Exactly. Um, I hope it gives them a launching. I'm sure Scream 4 didn't hurt Emma Roberts' career. I'm sure it only helped. Right. Um, I mean, look at where she's at now. Yeah, right? Like, absolutely. I I think the films are great for that, but I, I do not think that they... I think this whole meta horror and doing it for the horror fans i think we passed that and yeah. i think that you need to kind of if you want to be modern i, I honestly think scream 4 was a perfect way to end it i really yeah. do it was a and nice send off i wish they had just left it there and please stop bringing back Nev campbell and courtney cox like please stop like please yeah. please stop it's, it's, um, it's pointless now like you know Nev's trying to rock it out being a mom she probably is a mom in real life she's made her fucking money i don't know but hey if she gets a payday who am i to judge like right i mean good for you nev eh, good for you anyway that's uh that concludes our 52nd episode of the friday nightmare podcast <laughs> <laughs> scott's had 53 <laughs> because <laughs> i'm a jackass scott's pretty sure we're at 53 even though we're only at 52 nah, i know we're i know we're at 52 now after I... <laughs> it feels like 53 though for scott it um, feels like 500 episodes oh my god i'm still <laughs> recording with her <laughs> truth like that's <laughs> true like it's like as repetitive as scream six um right oh uh, i love it so 
yeah, we, we look forward to continuing this format some more. Obviously, um, we are still on the Legion Podcast Network. You can find us under the Kill the Cast feed. Uh, the Friday, it's Kill the Cast for Sun's Friday Nightmares. We're also part of Legion Patreon. Uh, you, if you're a Patreon member, you can find shows and stuff that we do on there. We do a top five that we release early on there. And then we also um, release it to our regular feed. Anything else you want to add, Scotty? Just join us. Because <laughs> what do you, so join Legion Patreon today because Scotty. What are you waiting for? <laughs> what are you waiting for? You know, if we ever don't have Patreon anymore, I don't it's, know how we're going to. We'll, we'll find a way to tie it in. We'll find a way to tie it in. Um, but yeah, I guess that's it on my end. Scotty, do you have anything to say good to the good people? Uh, just that uh, thank you all for listening as usual. And uh, yep, we're going to continue for, I don't know how many episodes, but doing some more horror from around the world. Um, haven't decided on exactly what country we'll be focusing on next, but we got a couple in mind. So yeah, well, just, language, because uh, we don't focus on countries. Oh, yeah, true, true, true. Yeah, mm-hmm. language. But yeah, so yeah, we'll uh, we'll see what we come up with. Uh, but until next time, kitties, unpleasant dreams. See ya.